for this. Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'll sign it later, thank you. I got into Cambridge without uh, having any idea that I was the slightest bit creative. Creativity, which just means knowing how to come up with a better idea, was never mentioned at my school. But then I joined the Cambridge Footlights and I found that I could write something on a blank sheet of paper which would make people laugh. And then I discovered something else. If I wrote a sketch in the evening but got stuck and went to bed, when I got up in the morning and sat down at my desk, I saw the solution almost straight away. And this happened so often, I slowly realised that my brain must have been working on the problem while I was asleep. And that's when I decided to try to understand what creativity is all about. And today, I'm going to talk to some people who might be able to help me. I'm going to start with a great lyricist. Yes, you. Tim Rice, ladies and gentlemen. And Tim, why or when did you first sense you could be creative? Well, I think I was inclined to be creative from a young age, but I had no concept of being creative. I thought I was just writing you just thought nice that was poems the way for my mum. It was, yeah. yeah. I remember writing for her 28th birthday almost a whole book really? of poems and um, drawings. I mean, they were terrible, but I always wanted to write things. But I had no, no concept whatsoever of this could be something that would be a career. I just... It was fun. Or even unusual. I, you're right. I didn't think it was unusual. Oh. Um, my brothers did much the same thing a few years later. And I think my, my parents were both writers um, to a certain extent. My mother, very much so. So I suppose it's So you it were natural. used to this atmosphere. Yes, yeah. but, but we weren't running around thinking what a creative artistic no, family no, we were. No, no, because it was so natural for your family, yeah. yeah. We were kind enough to have a look at that little book I read about creativity. Yes. Was there anything in it that you disagreed with? Um, no, I don't know. I don't I, mind. It'd be more I, interesting if you did, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you see, I find that I have to get into a, what I call a creative mood before it starts to come. I can't just sit down and start writing. No, I've, I've totally sympathised with your um, getting a space and, and taking time to get into your space and, and no distractions. And my problems often be in that I, I tend to look for distractions. Ah, yes. You think, I've got to write something. That's and right. you'd suddenly think, on the other hand, my CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. <laughs> and I, I'll do that now because it'll only take five yeah, minutes. Yeah. And that takes... Or you sort your socks. Yes, you, you, yes. you, um, you sharpen pencils. Sharpen pencils, anything, all these things. Anything to avoid the but moment. But if you can get going... But there's so many things you said which rang true, like you get stuck and you go out and take the dog for a walk. Yeah for yeah. half an hour, and when you come back, your brain has recharged. But a lot of stuff is just given to you, isn't it? Do you know it, what I mean? Some of it you get to yourself yes. by oh, logic, yes. but a lot of the times the best ideas pop up while you're taking the dog for a walk. Exactly. And, and you, you mentioned that there are, there, are, there, are, there are two parts of your brain, the hare and the tortoise. Yes. And, and your hare is racing ahead with ideas and sometimes comes to a blockage. Yeah. Whereas but the tortoise tends to be plodding along all along and you can dip into that without really 
without really knowing your diplomacy. Well, a lot of thinking is just, uh, it's just think, sort of logic, and you can do that. You don't have to be clever or creative. It will be a waste of time. So when you do, when you, when you sort of sit down to write, you, you, you do eventually, after you've done the socks and sharpened the pencils, yeah. you sit down. Then your mind is full of all these things, oh, I should have called so-and-so and I haven't bought the cat a birthday present, you know, yes. that sort of stuff. you've got to get rid of all then that. Then you, you settle down. Yes. And at that point, something starts to happen. Do you think, does that describe your... Yes. It, it obviously depends to a certain extent on what your task is. Yeah. But one of the rules I've always tried to follow is always write something you would like if somebody else had written it. Uh, um, and so you've got a fighting chance when you've finished it um, of actually quite liking it yourself. You may get fed up with it after a while, but... But that's but, very interesting. But, that seems very difficult. Well, some, I mean... S somebody else might have written it. No, somebody else would, would write well, if this. If somebody else not... had written... I mean, I sort of think if... I want to write something that I would like if, yeah. you know, somebody else had, 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 had done it. And um, I, th I think I always have that in the back of my mind, which really means I've got to like it myself. I, you, you, you mustn't try and write something you think is this year's trend. No, no, no. Um, the moment you write for an audience, yes. something goes. It might work financially, but it's never and, going to be good art. And I've always said there are really no hard and fast rules, because when we wrote Superstar, we couldn't get any, anybody to stage it, um, any theatrical producer, the camera Macintoshes of the day. They said, well, the, you know, the two guys are unknown, and, and, but above all, they said, religion, forget it. It would mm. never work. And, We'd, we'd sort of said rather feebly, well, it's not really a religious piece, it's about, it's a story, mm. and it's being told in a new way. And because nobody wanted to stage it, we were forced, our manager managed to get a deal to do it on record. Um, and that was great because, firstly, we, we ditched any idea of having dialogue, which mm -hmm. we'd, we'd thought about, and we turned it into an opera in the sense that it was non-stop music with no, no speech. And also, we were able to use much bigger forces. Andrew could have a rock band and a big orchestra and a choir, which, had we staged it, even in the West End, you wouldn't have had that in those days. The technology wasn't there. And we probably would have opened in a very nice provincial theatre with a nine-piece band <laughs> yes. with no, yeah. no yeah. rock section. This and, is fascinating and, to and, hear this. And the superstar would have... which originally was just called Jesus Christ, which perhaps was, a, was, was, was not the ideal title. But um, it would have probably died the death in some mm. very nice provincial theatre. But doing it on record changed the whole piece, and the record took off like a bullet, not here, but in America. When you were surprise. saying that, I thought you might muse to know that when we were uh, luxuriating the, in the success of the Holy Grail, we had a meeting and um, we said, what are we going to do next? And Eric Idle said, I think we should make a film called Jesus Christ, Lust for Glory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was our contribution to the religious atmosphere of the time. Tim, I want to introduce uh, a great friend of mine, John Dupre. John has written an immense... Come on in, John. He's written an immense amount of music for Monty Python. I'm, yep, he wrote I'm, yep, the music for Spamalot. And he wrote the music oh, for... Uh, what an honour to meet you, sir. An honour to meet you, John. <laughs> so it is, up. too. And I think he's a bit of a genius, because he can sit down at a piano and, within about four seconds, come up with a tune. I, 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 I... That's just blind panic. <laughs> no, no, but it's an extraordinary... I, I've never thought of a tune in my life. I don't know how you think of a tune, because the moment I think of a tune, I think, oh, no, it's that tune. You were saying that you were a little bit surprised that... Tim sometimes uh, does lyrics from the song. Normally it's the other Absolutely. way Absolutely. It seems to me that the really... The, a very hard thing to do, um, that normally the, the words and the idea, you know, sort of uh, like the way Elton works, that you've said, you know, that the, the lyric comes first and then you form the tune for the Well, for that's the, the way lyric. Elton works. Yeah. When, I, when I first worked with him, I assumed, like all composers, he had a lot of great tunes lying around in his locker. Uh -huh. And I said, you got any great tunes for, for this Lion King lark? And he said, no. And I said, have you got any 
reasonable tunes. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> even a reasonable tune by Elton would be better than most people's tunes. But he said, no, no, I never write a tune until I get the lyrics. And I, I didn't know that about him. I knew that Bernie wrote lyrics, by and large, first. Yes. Um, but I didn't know that, that Elton only ever did that. I'm fascinated. I mean, I'm listening to the radio and something like the... the um... Uh, a Brandenburg Concerto or uh, Honky Tonk Women or Memories or, or, or something. It's the way that what becomes a hit or it, the difference between that and an ordinary song I find absolutely fascinating. And I, I, I wonder if it's an external thing, whether, whether I've heard that music's sort of out there and you have to channel it. And that there are some musical it. architect types out there. I'm interested in that. I'm sorry, John. No, I so just no. have to stop you there because I'm getting a lot of signs saying this has become very, very boring. So thank you very much <laughs> for coming you, along, Tim. <laughs> and thank you thank for you, being sir. so boring, John. <laughs> I, I've read some of your stuff, and I, uh, I mentioned this to you the other day. I, I like your ruthlessness. It gets, my ruthlessness gets me into a lot of trouble. Yeah, I know, but it's worth it, isn't it? Yeah. I'm um, not sure sorry you can get anything done unless you're a bit ruthless. Well, I think in this era, it requires a, a certain amount of nerve to put anything to paper, really. Yeah. Because it is so easy to get yourself into trouble yeah. using a single word in a way that people take the wrong way, or... Yes, particularly literal-minded people take something the wrong way because they don't understand the importance of context in affecting the meaning. Oh, also, we're surrounded by killjoys. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> nothing gets you into more trouble, and you should know this, than a joke. Yes, absolutely. And, yeah. and I simply cannot write a completely straight-faced column or book. And it's what, what I write that... It's really just to amuse myself that gets me into such hot water. When I was reading, uh, we was talking about Kevin, I had to stop after a time because I was feeling hopeless. Hopeless? Yeah, seriously. Because I think uh, there's, I've always had a, a fear of hopelessness. I always need to be able to do something to make things better. And when that's not possible, I think I kind of panic. And it set a little bit of that off, so I'm reading it in <laughs> slices. <laughs> I write about a lot of dark subjects, but the execution is not dark. No. Um, there are writers who want to make their audience suffer. And I'm not one of them. I don't think of literature as medicinal. <laughs> when you settle down to write in the morning, can you just settle down and start writing, or do you have a little routine, like I sort of sharpen pencils and tidy things. Do you have anything just to get into a mood? No. No? In general, I have resisted rituals. Have I think you? they are just delay mechanisms. And I also think that it's a mistake to imagine that you have to go through some kind of mystical sequence. I don't believe in mystification. It's a job. And so... I don't, I don't depend on being in a mood or feeling like it. That's the formula for never getting it done. Eventually, you know, if I, if I sit there yeah. and I don't have anything else to do, then I will generate text. Well, I could never figure out why I always put off the moment of writing and I thought I was just wasting time. And then I slowly came to the conclusion that it was actually getting me into a more of a writery mood. Because mm. a, a, a psychologist once said to me, if you're sad, you have sad thoughts. If you're angry, you have angry thoughts, all that. He mm. said, you want to create, you want to have a creative feeling about you, which I get by relaxing and very much by stopping interruptions. And I thought it was a waste of time, but I now think it's a way of moving from an ordinary everyday let's deal with the world mood to, to something that's more creative. I've had to develop a less protective uh, way of going about things. First off, I'm, I'm interrupted all the time <laughs> by people who want me to do something. Of course. Like this. But, <laughs> um, and thanks for so doing it. So you have interrupted me. <laughs> um, and we'll make the best of it. 
But uh, furthermore, I live with a drummer. I'm married to a drummer. A drummer, yes. Who has sessions in our house <laughs> and also practices. And I have learned to completely tune him out. I can tune out whole bands playing downstairs. Uh. Uh, all I have to do is pay attention to what I'm doing. You went and lived in Belfast. <laughs> it, was, it seems a very strange thing for a writer to do to me. Were you getting material? Well, actually, I have to say that at the time, it was a trite thing for a writer to do, especially a novelist. Really? Um, this business of setting a novel in, in Northern Ireland when you're from elsewhere uh, was a cliche by the time I got there in 1987. There had been many, many novelists who had come through and wanted to set uh, something in the troubles. Uh, it was a little depressing when I first got there. I thought... Everyone uh, was at it. I learned quickly to be embarrassed by my presence in the town. <laughs> um, so I mostly redeemed myself by sticking around. That is, what made me not a cliche was having lived there for 12 years. 12 and years. And most novelists came in for six months, yeah, got a yeah. feel for the setting, and, and checked out again. Was it something about the atmosphere around there that made it, oh. <laughs> hey, I'm talking to You're Lionel. not the star. <laughs> Sit You're down. You're not the star. <laughs> Um, was there something about the atmosphere that actually fed your creativity? Um, it had a nice combination of a place that was in, in a, a lot of ways uh, off the beaten track, out of the way. Yeah. Uh, I lived at the, in the attic of, of an old Vic Victorian house uh, with grounds. Um, it was really cheap, uh, so it... It suited my economics. Uh, it was it, very peaceful. Um, I, but at the same time, it was somewhere where something was happening. Yeah. That, that it had a sense of eventfulness about it, and you never knew when something was going to blow up. Yeah. And, well, uh, I was going to wonder whether you were sort of, there was gunfire. Well, it was, it was a time when, the, you know, the army was still on the streets. Yeah. It was a fascinating place to be. And, oh, um, what a shame. No, thank you. <laughs> You're wonderfully determined. Um, yeah, cats and I don't get on. You don't get on? Yeah. They poop in my garden the, all the time. <laughs> I think they're the meaning of life myself. But, but what, I, what I really got out of Belfast was first, I got my, I cut, I cut my journalistic teeth there. Yeah. I started writing for the Wall Street Journal Europe, uh, comment pieces of, about political shenanigans there. And I got a, 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 the equivalent of a PhD's worth of, of political education. It made me far more cynical. Yes. And it made me more conservative. Yes. I found that, uh, especially uh, ostensibly liberal, American support for the IRA, atrocious. And that severed my, uh, my allegiance to li liberal Democrats in the United States. And it released me, and that's how I was raised. My yeah. parents were liberal Democrats. Yeah. And it released me t into a, a much more independent-minded Politics. I started thinking for myself for the first time in my yeah, life. Yeah, that's what I notice about your writing. And on that point, thank you. That was, for me, quite wonderful. Thank well, I enjoyed talking to you. It's fun. And I'm, I'm one of those extremely boring people who can't help but tell you how much I loved growing up on Monty Python. Oh, how sweet. It's been a great anyway, pleasure. Enjoy Bless talking you. to you. I'm Andrew Doyle, executive producer of The Dinosaur Hour, and Lewis Schaefer with me here. You were the maitre d' in The Dinosaur Hour. No, I was the star of the entire show, and I think people are going to see that when they... Uh, you were, they're but we, see we cut you out a lot. You, you know, know what? If my mother was still living, she would, like, 
be furious. She would, but she's she not. Would. And I knew that that was okay. No, but I am in. I am in the uh, opening. I hope you don't cut out the opening section. No, you're in the opening section. I'm in the opening but, section. And of course, working with John Cleese, that must be uh, exciting. Well, that was that was amazing, really. I didn't appreciate it at the time, but then I'm, I'm sitting there working with him. I'm thinking, this is John Cleese. Yeah. This is John Cleese, as in cheese. He's and you got, got to get that yeah. right. He, he hate in America they yeah. call him Cleese. Yeah. And he really has a problem with that. But you're an American and you're getting it right. Well, my name is Schaefer. People say Schaffer. You just got to get used to it. <laughs> or change your name to something that everybody pronounces yeah. properly. Yeah, people normally get mine right. Although I was called Andrew Boyle yeah. by a critic once. Maybe an angry. Uh, because that's the, probably the first time that's ever happened to you with yeah. me. My name has been misspelled. I remember one time I noticed my name was spelled correctly at a restaurant. And I was like, it was maybe it was in my 30s. And I was like shocked <laughs> because it never happens. But John Cleese. John Cleese. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 the great thing about the show was to be able to make the show that he wanted to make, which was talking to the people that he found interesting uh, about the subjects that he found interesting. And that yeah. isn't something that normally uh, is granted by television channels to stars. They normally tell them what they have to do, no. where they have to stand, yeah. all of that. Well, let's just let's just hope that people he finds interesting are people we find interesting. Or that the audience finds interesting. That's what I mean, yeah. Well, I found them interesting. No, I found them interesting. Yeah. I have to find them interesting because I'm working with John Cleese. Yes. It's interesting watching John talk about creativity in this analytical way, you know, because you normally mm. think of creativity in the abstract and yeah. but actually sort of working it out and how it works and how the human brain... And, and this idea that anyone could be creative, you know? Yeah. Because, like, traditionally people have said, you know, there are creative people, innately creative people. And he's saying, no, everyone can be. And actually, it's really important uh, for everyone to be creative, no matter what you do for a living. Um, I think... Uh, You're I, a creative person. No, I'm not a creative person. I think, I think he's right. Everybody could be creative. But you know, most people don't need to be super creative. Because they, they go to a job, they got to follow the rules. We don't need people to be creative. Isn't that we need sad? People... No, it isn't. When you end up sad. in a job where you don't have a, it's... a room for creativity, that's kind of it's so bourgeois. The idea of everyone's a comedian, everyone's got some art things. I remember I was in LA, I was living in LA for a year, and uh, and I met the guy who was head of Playboy magazine. Hugh Hefner. No, Playgirl magazine, the oh, cheaper version. The cheaper one. Okay, the cheaper yeah. version. And. And he, he was he kept on telling me about how he's written a screenplay. He's like a multimillionaire, not a UF, it was the other guy. Multimillionaire, and he wasn't happy with it. And I think that's... Yeah, because he needed, he had a lust for, to be creative. We've been told to be creative. Most people don't need no, you to know, be creative. So Oscar Wilde wrote an essay on, on yeah. it was called The Soul of Man Under Socialism. He talks about we all need more leisure time. Everyone should have more leisure time so we can all be more creative. Everyone should have the time to express themselves and find out who they really are and read and develop and create. He's onto something, right? Um, I've changed your mind. That's all I did. Creativity for. is nice, but I don't think people need creativity in general. I think I think they do. Or we're just robots if we don't have any creative Well, back impulse. in the day, what did they used to do? They used to take a little bit of wood and they used to carve a, a thing and, and everybody carved a little something funny, an icon or something. So That's there what was, everyone used to do back yeah, in the day. They yeah, they did. Everybody did, did everyone something did slightly creative. My grandmother used to crochet things, things yeah, yeah. in a creative way. But <laughs> the, the idea that you can't get any joy out of not being creative? Not, not being creative in an artistic... Maybe you're talking about artistic way. The Dinosaur Hour, with me, John Cleese, on GB News. Hello. Hello. So, uh, I'm now going to talk to a man for whom I have enormous respect. He is not a critic, he's a reviewer. He's been described as the man who knew more about Broadway than anyone else. He's written definitive biographies of Arthur Miller and uh, Tennessee Williams. And his reviews and writings about show business are the... Get out! What are you doing here? <sighs> Rouse! Rouse! Not you, cat. John La. John, good to How see are you? you. I'm well. Nice to see you. Uh, John and I have a rather interesting connection because, John, you married uh, one of my ex wives, I think. I, I have indeed. You've married Connie Booth. For about 35 years now, we've been. Oh, been come on. Yeah, it's not it goes that, back long. that far. Is it really? Yeah. 
How wonderful. And I want to tell you something. I think you know this. I've told you before. Your dad was a great star. T tell us a little bit about him. Well, my father was... English people would know him as uh, the Cowardly Lion and the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. But he had a, a phenomenal uh, run uh, as a performer and was very, very... In his day, was one of the great low comedians of the first half of the 20th century. When he died in 1967, his, his face was on the cover, on the, on the front page of the... It was front page news of the Times. And when I went to write... A, this pertains to writing about theatre. Yeah. When I wrote his book, I realised that nothing that was written about him bore any real relation to who he was. And so part of what got me on the road to writing about theatre was trying to leave a better narrative about theatre and theatricals to carry that knowledge further and uh, expand it. I make a distinction between reviewing yes. and criticism. Reviewing is, as it now is, is a consumer function. Uh, the, the, the articles, such as they are, are really just to tell the reader whether they should go and see it. Well, that's part of what criticism is, but really what criticism is, is to put a play, a play is meant to stimulate thought. And from my point of view, criticism really extends that into the world. It thinks about the play and puts it in a context of the culture, psychology, all sorts yeah, of things. Yeah. Whereas a review is in the context of no context. Oh, I see what you, you mean. You see what I'm saying? If you like when you well, write... Well, when I read about what people write about your pieces, they always talk about the depth, that they have much more depth than most what uh, well, portraits. That's part of the... Well, for 20 years, I was the drama critic of The New Yorker. And that's the sort of gift of having space and time. Most reviews are written in a very short space. You can't really think no, in the way, the way I'm no, talking no, no, about no, in 800 words. Can't do it. But you do really long thought pieces well, about a, some a of the long, great stars. You can, you can get something going yeah. and you can have an idea or express an idea in... Uh, in uh, <laughs> Thank you. In, in, Don't drink it. That's very nice. Good. In uh, 1,500 words. But it, it's basically a point of view. I mean, I think uh, I, a critic, and I'm not talking just about myself, but uh, Eric Bentley, uh, Kenneth Tynan, they are really in the uh, illumination business. Yes, yes, you're, right. You're there to ha stimulate thought. And you're there to have an argument, perhaps, but it's uh, not to dismiss. The most important thing about a critic is that he loves the medium that he's criticizing. That and that he knows something about it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I forgot that bit. <laughs> yes. But you, you know, I, I think it's Christopher Hampton said, to ask a working writer what he thinks of critics is like asking a lamppost what he thinks of dogs. <laughs> and, of course, the thing I object to in that joke is working writer because the, I think there's, only, there's just good writing and bad writing, mm -hmm. and, and elegance or eloquence comes in, in any genre, mm -hmm. any genre. Mm -hmm. And my objection to a lot of the, re the reviewing is that the people who are passing judgment uh, are book-learned, but they haven't ever written anything, they haven't made anything, they've never done, not written a joke mm. or a play, had an acting lesson. They have no idea of... of they, they can see something, they can know it's good, but they don't know why it's good. That's exactly the point. I'm so glad you made that and, point. But, you see, that's part of the differentiation between most of the really important critics on either side of the Atlantic have all slept on both sides of the bed. They've made theater and they've yes. uh, written about it. They know what the process is. Finally, going back to creativity, how much creativity do you think there is in 
reviewing or, or critiquing well, it? Well, as you write in your book on creativity, criti creativity is play. And my job is to sit in front of the play and let it happen on yeah, me, yeah, yeah. play with it. And when I sit in front of a, in, in a typewriter, I'm playing, I'm discovering it again, I'm reimagining it, and I'm playing with the ideas and seeing how they resonate with uh, me and in the yeah, culture. Yeah, so in that yeah. sense, you're starting with a blank page and you're building up a story which describes what you've, you've seen, but also pushes it out and paints a larger picture. So in that sense, you're creating a, a, a narrative yeah. which has, uh, hopefully, at its best, the possibility of entertaining and showing people something that they didn't know before. Yeah. And that's what is creative. And I now see, just listening to you now, why all the people writing about your writing talk about its depth. Well, that's, thank you, that's, John. Uh, pleasure. Really Keep enjoy. my love to Connie I will, tonight. I will. I will. Lewis Schaefer, what does... Yeah, that's my name. Yeah, sorry, sorry that again. was like an introduction I was doing. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I thought it was a reminder. No, I wasn't reminding you. You know what your name is. Okay. Lewis Schaefer, what does creativity mean to you? Well, here's the problem. The problem is I don't think about creativity that much. And when I listen to John, who's a great creative mind, yes. talking to other people about creativity in different ways, I, I yes, just... That's because you're innately creative and you don't like to think about it. You don't need to analyze it. You know? I don't think I'm creative. I think I am chaotic and we just accept the chaos. And the chaos... Well, so like create, creative is a sort of euphemism for just anarchic? Not necessarily. Some people have to be... I th yes. But you so, do. You put on shows. I put on and shows. And you go to Edinburgh and you, 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 know, you have a problem in your life. What do you yeah. do? Your solution to that is to write a comedy show about that, put it on, and, and, and tell a whole bunch of strangers about your problems. That's a creative form of self-therapy. But that's not what I do. That's exactly I, what you no. do. No, what I do is I do with you right now, is we're sitting here talking about this, and if something's funny, I might write down it later and repeat it. Yeah. It's, it it's not like I, I think, oh, I'm gonna say that to Andrew, that's gonna be funny. So I don't think that way. John Cleese and these other people sit down and think, oh, this would make a nice painting, yeah. or this could be a good story, or this could be a good sketch. Well, that was interesting, because the, the painter that he spoke to, you yeah. see whether she was talking about the what inspires her. Why does she do the creative things that yeah. she does? It's clear that it is a kind of vocation that for an artist, a true artist, she couldn't do anything else. Like, it's just, it is just who she is. I don't think you could do anything else. Not because you're incompetent, yeah. although there is an element of that, but more that you, you know, you, you need to be a comedian, you need to be a performer. Something inside you, you know, is screaming out for attention. No. No, I could do lots of things. I've done other things, and I've done other things well. I sold advertising space, I was an estate agent. Were you? Yeah, I did lots of other things. It's this this. Yeah, myth. but you didn't end up doing that. You didn't end up as an estate agent. No, lady. because my father left me some money and I didn't need to. Really it's, it's so interesting because I, I, it really, it just it bothers me thinking about it because I don't do what that, I should do what that is. I should read Adam Bloom's book. I should read. Yeah, but you don't, no, well. I should learn. I should sit down at a desk and write out jokes. I can't do that. Like you, like you say, my, my show, what, what is my show? You say the same things over and over again. People laugh and you, you don't realize. Well, that, is that, a, that is a kind of craft in of itself. It is, is a craft. Kind of, yeah, yeah. It is a craft, but it's not like sitting down and thinking, oh, what are they going to find funny? Yeah, yeah. Okay. John Cleese has unlimited patience. He does. Yeah. But with you. You're with me, with everybody. I, I, I don't have limits. I have very, I'm very impatient with you. I don't think you are, no. I think you're trying to do what's best for the show, and I think you just handle it in a, in a, in a bad way. Yeah. He's 83 years old. He knows he knows what to do yes. with people. And a lot of the thing that on screen is him, like, saying I'm an idiot or stupid or whatever it is. Yes. And, but but in, in our private dealings, he was very cordial. It's an odd place to film it, the castle in the middle of Essex. It really was the middle yeah. of no, nowhere. I mean, there was nothing anywhere. I don't know why you chose it. I mean, you could have probably built a set for less money. We probably could. And it would have been closer, and you wouldn't have had to schlep people all the way to but, the middle. Well, Peddington Castle. It's not very useful for you to tell me this now. Yeah. This is the kind of advice I could have had before 
the show started. I t listen to me. I try to keep out of your business, Andrew. I'm so happy to be getting a job. My life was at the lowest point. You you saved me. That's the thing yeah. I learned. About. Can I say one thing? You can say whatever you like. Yeah. What actual John? Please less is more. Yes, whereas your yeah. instinct is to overplay. Yes, because, yeah. I'm, because I'm an amateur and a failure. You're a drama queen. Yeah. But <laughs> Everything's got to be a drama with you. I'm more of a drama princess. I haven't re reached the queen stage. The Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese, on GB News. Well, I can't talk about creativity uh, without talking about painting. And fortunately, I've known a very good painter for a very long time. I love her very much. She's Lucy Willis. She lives in Somerset. Lucy, I'm so glad you could do this. Thank you for having me, John. Oh, we love each other. I've, I used to have so many of your paintings and I had to sell them when I lost all my money. <laughs> so you told me. <laughs> yes. yes. That was terrible. Um, what I'm interested in is you, you, you do representational art which is the art that I enjoy. But I'm interested in what you add. I mean, you look at a, 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 a landscape or a piece of a street or something like that, and then you start to paint it, but you're not copying it. You're doing something else to make it into a great painting. What, do you do you think about that, or does it just happen automatically? No, it, it, there's always a little thought process yeah? that happens before the beginning of a painting, and, and sometimes it's an extremely short little process where you see something, you just think, that's exciting, lovely. It's yeah. very often, in my case, it's very often to do with the light. Um, I, I paint a lot of things that are... Sunlight. Sunlight, shadow, nighttime scenes, but with a little bit of subtle mm -hmm. moonlight, window light, yeah, something yeah. like this. It's very often the trigger is, is the light, and I'll see it and I'll log it in my head and think that I could possibly make a painting from. Apart from your technique, what else are you adding in a sense of Creative. That's an creative. impossible question to yeah, answer. Probably, yeah, probably. But try anyway. It's <laughs> your what you. It's this thing about the initial spark. You have to try and transmit yeah. that onto a two-dimensional surface, um, that so that it's communicated to someone else. Because that's what you're doing. You're trying to show someone else how delighted you've been by something, or how horrified, yeah. or how. Well, let's talk about whatever. some of your paintings because. Um, this is one, this is very typical of your work, I think. Could you put it up so we can't see your face? Thank you, just a little <laughs> higher. Thank you, thank you. Now tell me. Um, so here, for instance, when I see something like this with a shadow and a little oh, bit of translucence, yeah. I would go, oh, that's yummy, I, I can paint that. <laughs> and also, you know, sunlight shining through, uh, this yeah. is actually a white bougainvillea. Um, and, and shadows on the ground. It gives a sense of warmth, of well-being and delight. This one, it took my breath away when I looked at that one. Thank you, Jonathan. Right up, please, right up. No more. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Now, when I saw that, I, well, I had a shiver, though, but what media is that? That is an etching. What I did, I was in India and yeah. I had a sketchbook which I filled with sketches on beaches. All right. This particular beach was just Where the most it? exciting place. It's just outside, it's at a place called Juhu, just outside Bombay, oh, or yeah. Mumbai. It's inked with blue at the top, darker in the middle, and, and I print these at home on my etching press. Really? What have we got here? Hand. Oh, thank you, Donald. Good. I think you. Oh, dear. <laughs> he is completely helpless. Could you hold that one right up so we can't see anything of you, anything of you at all? Tell me about this one. This is a drawing that I did in the studio. Yeah. It's a pastel. It's done in pastel. Oh, it's People pastel. talk about yes, pastel so it painting, Sorry, so it's, yeah. it, it's a painting but in pastel. Um, and it's done from a, from a series of photographs that I took in the living room of a, of a very good friend of ours in Tbilisi, in Georgia. Oh, in Georgia. And um, I couldn't sit down and, and paint while no. I was in her flat, so I took some pictures, and then when I got home, I 
collage what, them what together. And... That... My eye goes to her all the time. The colour there, this very, very warm colour. Is that, what was it? The, the, the whole bit? atmosphere. I'm trying the to atmosphere. get the atmosphere ah, of yeah. the flat, the clutter, the, the translucence of the curtains, the glowing of the standard lamp and so on. That seems to be the lot. Oh, no, we've got another one coming up, which used to belong to a comedian called Cleese. A comedian called John Cleese, who very Tell kindly Tell me about it. this one, because we need two people here. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, <laughs> T t tell me about this one. Lift it up so that it's horizontal. Really. Down this... a bit, your your. Do you know right what there. people people are not going to like you if you attack me? Every... They love it when I attack you. No, they, they don't. They can't stand you. They... Oh, shut up, right, <laughs> Lucy. This was the local prison in Somerset where I was oh, given. Oh, in Somerset, my dear. We're in Somerset, and I was given the job of teaching an evening class really? to the inmates. They came along, but they, they weren't that interested until I went one week and said, how about if we get one of you guys to sit here and I'll draw a portrait oh. of you? I accumulated a portfolio of sketches, which I then took back home and I thought, I wonder if I could sort of manipulate these individual sketches into a... to, to give the effect of my class. Ah. Um, but it, it, it captured the absolute boredom of being in prison, yeah. although my class was, in fact, quite an entertaining sort of jolly atmosphere in reality. You know, I wasn't... Um, I was talking to somebody yesterday who was telling me how enormously helpful it is for people in prison to get involved in artistic... Uh, perceives that it yes. changes everything, yeah. which I don't understand why it does, but it well, seems it, as if it does. Very often... If you can learn a skill of any sort, yes. it, it, it yeah, changes yeah. your outlook. Um, but, you know, if perhaps if you can't read and write, but you can learn to draw, draw or, yeah, yeah. or paint, or, and there's... Um, unfortunately, there's just... The, cut, the funding has been cut massively well, from that sort of thing. Well, of course, because the Tories don't understand about anything like that. Lucy, that was just lovely. And thank you so much for coming to talk to me. Well, thank, thank you. Dear woman. I still feel that there's things that uh, we've left out so far, so I've invited an old friend here, Guy Claxton, to come and talk to me so we can talk about some of them now. Guy here is kind of my mentor, <laughs> because in 1990 when? 1997, I wrote Seven. the book. He wrote a book called Hair Brain, Tortoise Mind. And almost all the thinking I've done about creativity since is based on that one book. Because wow. you were suggesting that there's different speeds of thinking and that they are suitable for different tasks. Yes. In order to solve problems, you need to use the right tools for the job. Yes. As in any kind of, if you're a carpenter or a plumber, you have to use the right tools for the job. And our thinking tools vary in all kinds of ways, but when I was thinking, when I was writing that book, I was thinking that they vary in their speed, so that some of the tools are, are really fast. You know, if you're, you're having to respond very quickly, be very creative in the moment, like a tennis player ah. or a cricket player, you don't have time to think. Split you have to second. Respond. Split second, absolutely, faster than thought. Then there are the kind of logical, you know, the court of law, the learned lecture kinds of things which operate at the speed of thought, limited by the way we're speaking now. You can't speed me up too much or, you, or I stop making sense. sense yeah. And then there are other kinds of thinking that are slower than thought. You know, you can't slow thought down mm. too, too much or it stops making sense. Other registers. And it's very important to get the right register for the right job. Different kinds of problems need different speeds. And I think what I was thinking when I wrote the book was our culture, in a way, has sort of forgotten about the two outer sets of speeds, the, the slow gear and the fast gear, if you like. And we want we try and do everything at the speed of thought. We try and put everything into that And we that assume box. that speed of thought is a good thing. We assume that it's a good thing and we assume that it's a ubiquitously good yes, thing, that it's, yes. good, it's good for everything. It's like snake oil 
for the mind, if you like. Right. You know, it, it Whereas works if for you're using the, the, the slower mode, what you call tortoise mind, yeah. you can deal with problems that you simply can't begin to solve if you're in a faster way of thinking. Yeah, that's right. If you're in a court of law, thought, the speed of thought works very well. It usually comes out with the right answer. But if you're writing poetry or devising a new scientific theory, a lot of that work, it turns out, is done not at the conscious, yeah. deliberate, articulate level. Einstein put it very well. He said, the words of the language only come into my creative process at a very late stage. Yes. The actual creativity itself is done through thinking slowly and through what Einstein called more or less clear images. Yes. So he's speaking, he's working in a different language. You could call it a language, but it's a visual language. And he said and also a physical language. The language of physical promptings yeah. is important. And only at, right at the last minute, when he has to explain his thinking to other people, does it then have to get squeezed into the box of words, if you like. Yes, that's, that's so interesting because the assumption is you've got to th uh, think fast. And no one during my entire education, which was a good English education yeah. in a prep school, public school, nobody ever said to me, it's okay on some subjects just to think about them and then let your no. unconscious when, did, do did, the work. Did a, did a teacher ever did, did ask you a question and you said, you know, it's a good question, sir. Let me get back to you on that, <laughs> right? Right. I remember being, I must have been about 12 and I was sitting in a lesson. I remember it very clearly. And I was gazing out of the window and the teacher said, what are you doing, Claxton? And I said, I'm thinking, sir. He said, well, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes, I was... He out. thought, he assumed that yeah, I was wasting my time. Of course. I mean, you had to be yeah. Einstein to be able to sit there with your yeah, feet yeah. on your... On, on the, your desk. On your desk right. at Princeton University. And yeah. people think, oh... Einstein's working. Yeah. Well, there is, most of us do that. They, we, you yeah. know, we were slacking. Absolutely. Yeah. Dream time. I mean, if you ask people when they get their best ideas, it's not when they're right yeah. up against the deadline, when they're, you know, in a court of law or something yeah. like that. It's, I mean, when do you get your best ideas? Often when you're falling asleep, when you're walking the dog, when Absolutely. you're on the, in loo, the shower. in the shower. And when then you're something not that you've been chewing over, yeah. you've got to chew, chew it over first, yeah. and then you can leave it pretty much for your unconscious to suddenly present you yes. with the answer. It turns out it's often the case that, particularly with things like scientific theorising, that you need to do a lot of hard work first. You need, as it were, to exhaust the harebrain the wretched hair mm. that's, ra that's running mm. around all the time. Mm. You have to run it, run it to exhaustion. Oh, that's interesting. And then, then you go... And to... then, as it were, you say, OK, unconscious, over to you. Yeah. I think one you of the... You see, what I say in the book, in my little book, which I know you've read... Yeah. Um, uh, what I say is you've got to get away from ordinary life because I looked at some research which had done on architects. Mm-hmm. And what, the, what they discovered was the only difference between the creative ones and the uncreative ones is that the creative ones could play. Yes. Yes? Yes. Then I read a book by a Dutch guy uh, called Homo Ludens, Playing yes. Man. Yes. And he said, if you're going to play, you have to separate play from ordinary life. Yes, you have right. to create. I think you, you are having read my book, you coined the, coined the phrase tortoise enclosures. Yeah, that's right. We have to protect space and time. Yeah, that's right. For the, for the tortoise. Otherwise, and, and the wretched hair just is bounding around all over the place. And planet. the trouble is keeping the hair out because any kind of interruption disturbs the peace that you need just yeah. to sit there and play. Yeah. And it's very easy. I mean, creativity is a delicate flower. Why are we so Luddite in education? Why do we resist having a, a slightly more sophisticated view of the mind which embraces the need to not only just invite but to cultivate playfulness of mind, the tolerance for making mistakes? 
Yeah. yeah. The example I was thinking of was a friend of mine, a wonderful primary school teacher, who has very subtle, subtle, clever ways of detoxifying the idea of making mistakes. Four-year-olds arrive in school already, some of them frightened of yes, making mistakes. Yes, yes. They've learned to be good little boys and good little girls, yeah. and they have to get everything right first time or they feel stupid. Yeah, it's crippling. So uh, Becky, my, my, my friend Becky, talks to the kids about, there's different, she says there's different kinds of mistakes, you know. There are smart mistakes, and then there are sloppy mistakes. Uh, a smart mistake was an idea you had based on the best information that you had at the time, and it just didn't turn out, but yeah, you learned a lot yeah, from it. Yeah. Sloppy mistake is you didn't bother. Yeah. Now, for children, that's very liberating, the idea that there is such... It's almost like an oxymoron, the idea of a smart mistake. Yeah. So then she's moved one stage further. On, she has a big display in her classroom, mistake of the week. <laughs> and her children queue up <laughs> to have their smart mistakes Steak. acknowledged as the smartest she mistake is of the week. a very smart That's woman. genius. Isn't that? It's genius. But one of the curses, isn't it, is this idea that thinking quickly is always better than thinking slowly. It's so this this idea again. It, it, it's very prevalent in business, the business world, which you I think know better than I do. But somehow or other, the kind of people we want around here are people who are decisive, right? Yeah. And if you allow or encourage a culture of speediness and decisiveness. Mm. That is, a lot of people don't realise that that is stupid. <laughs> That's the word. Literally stupid. You're stifling intelligence and creativity yeah. in your organisation because everybody thinks they have to be a clever dick and whatever question, however complex, however novel, whatever question comes up, the smartest person in the room is the one who has the quickest answer. Yes. Which who, is... Who is slick. Stupid. Yeah. What do they call them? They call them the um, <laughs> the articulate incompetence. Yes, absolutely. Right. Yes, they suffer from premature articulation. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good one. Thank you, Guy. Bless you for coming. Uh, cheers. Yes. Enjoy our water. It's the very best GB News water. Very good. Only been used once. You see, when people are trying to create, they want a quiet place with no interruptions where they can let their minds play and wander wherever they want to go without any hurrying. And sometimes they feel confused because they've never been there before and they're okay with that. Executives and managers are the polar opposite. They want to control everything, they demand clarity, they prize quick thinking, and they like their employees to work hard and humorlessly, and always in a hurry. So it's not surprising that the creatives and the suits don't get on, but we need them both. Because, as The Economist magazine once said about Hollywood, if the creatives are in control, the place soon goes bankrupt. And if the suits are in charge, then all the films are finished on time and under budget, but nobody wants to go and see them because they're so f boring. So there has to be balance, and that has to come from the top because they're the ones with the money and the power. Are you finished yet? Uh, well, and what was that bit about execs being boring? That oh, wasn't well, sorry, proof. I'll change that bit, actually. Well, what would you oh, like me to say? Don't what would you, bother. What? We'll sort it out in the edit. Let's cut to the music now. More energy this time. Hi. Half of me, philosophically, must ipso facto half not be. But half the bee has got to be vis-a-vis -vis its uh, entity. You see? But can a bee be said to be, or not to be, an entire bee when half the bee is not a bee due to some ancient injury? Singing. A la dee dee. One, two, three, and eight, the half a B. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and eight, the half a B. Is this wretched demi-B 
half asleep upon my knee, some freak from a menagerie. No, it's Eric the half a bee. Fiddly dum, a fiddly dee. I love this hive employee Bisected accidentally One summer afternoon by me I love him carnally He loves him carnally Semi-carnally The end. Next time on the Dinosaur Hour. I, I see these, you know, trans women are real women. No, you're not. Okay, that's the bottom line. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? <laughs> well, <laughs> she cost me 20 million. Oh. I want to know what you really feel about woke. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. To join me, Nana Aqueer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> What is this? Is it, you? It, it, you? <laughs> it's my new teeth. your new teeth? I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. 
With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us.